Enjoy a short guided meditation uh, today. And maybe I invite the children. You can go down and then uh, be like a lotus flower and uh, come back to our breathing and uh, touch the freshness inside us, the solidity, the clarity, and the space within ourselves. Oh, our teacher has arrived. I invite everyone to stand up to We would like to invite the village brothers and sisters to come forward for chanting.
La Sangha est invitée à retourner à sa respiration afin que l'énergie de la pleine conscience puisse nous rassembler comme un organisme coulant comme une rivière, sans plus aucune séparation. Puisse la Sangha tout entière respirer comme un seul corps, écouter comme un seul corps, chanter comme un seul corps, transcendant les frontières d'un soi illusoire nous libérant ainsi des complexes de supériorité, d'infériorité et d'égalité.
friends, we're reminded to turn off your mobile devices before we begin. Thank you. Good morning, dear Sangha. Today is uh, the 15th of August, 2013, and we are in Brook University on our fifth day of uh, the retreat with the team Happy Teachers Who Change the World. Today we have a session of questions and answers, and the children will have the chance to ask uh, a few questions first, maybe three. And then after that, the teenagers are encouraged to ask a few questions. <clears throat> and after that, the rest of us will have our chance to, to ask ours. We know that a good question can benefit many people. That is why we should ask the real question, the question of our heart. A question that has to do with our uh, practice, our suffering, our happiness. <clears throat> and those of us who have a question are invited to come up here and sit around there. It's very beautiful from here. The Sangha is beautiful. And they will take their turn to sit on that chair so that everyone can see him or her. And the uh, tradition is that um, before you ask the question, we listen to the bell and enjoy breathing in and out three times. There are a few, <coughs> there are a few questions that have been written down, and from time to time we can read one of these questions. Uh, if uh, If uh, you don't, do not want to come and sit up here, you might like to write down your question and ask someone to bring it to Sister Pine, who sit uh, close to Thai, and she uh, will uh, read uh, it from, uh, from the number of questions that are already written down. So the children, if you have any question, please come up here. Only three questions. And one person, one question.
Maybe two children can ask one question. <laughs> so, dear Sangha, this is uh, the first uh, question. Would you be willing to tell us the struggle that you have had and how meditation and the bell have helped you overcome it? Dear Thai, Dear Thai can you tell us about a struggle that you have had and how meditation and the bell helped you to overcome it? A struggle. If Thai ever had a struggle, and how <laughs> and how meditation and the bell helped Thai to overcome the struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a long war in Vietnam between the Vietnamese and the French. Very long war and many people died. And after that, there's, there was a war with uh, America. So it was a long period of, uh, of war. And many young people growing up in that, um, in that period of time suffer a lot. That those children who have lost their parents, who had their house burned down, it's a lot of suffering. At that time, there was a novice, novice monk. He was ordained at the age of 16. And he began to learn breathing, walking. So thanks to the practice, uh, he was able to suffer less. And he believed that um, the practice of uh, meditation, Buddhism, can help uh, people calm down and shorten the war. Uh, when uh, they studied uh, history, he found out that uh, during the Li dynasty, the Tan dynasty, under the 12th, 13th, 14th century, there was a long period of peace. And the kings of these dynasties practiced uh, meditation and there was uh, harmony and prosperity and peace in the country. So as a young man, he believed that the practice of Buddhism, the practice of meditation can, can help bring peace and harmony in the country. So he persevered and, and practiced. Uh, when the country was uh, divided into north and south, the north was communist, the south is anti-communist. Mm, they suffer a lot. And then uh, mother uh, passed away, so they had a depression. And thanks to the practice of mindful breathing, mindful walking, he was able to recover. So that is why they learned that um, the practice of mindful breathing, mindful walking can heal you. And when you got into uh, difficulties like that, you may get out thanks to the practice of mindful breathing and mindful uh, uh, walking. Thank you for the question. Please, uh, teenagers and adults, if you have questions, please come, us, come with us.
About your story, um, when the man said, um, you, yes, know him, how did that make you feel inside? So, dear Tai, this is, um, our friend remembers when Tai told the story about Tai's dream. And the secretary said yes to Tai, but not that other person who looked like Tai. Not him. He's not in the class. And our friend wants to know in, when Tai heard that from the secretary, yes, you, but not him, how did Tai feel? I think uh, everyone in the university would like to, to be accepted in that, uh, in that class. And uh, of course, uh, not everyone can be, could be accepted. And uh, there was a question, why that person looks so much like Thai? And he did not understand at that time. And he found out uh, the answer much later on. He found out that that, that young student that looked exactly like Thai was also Thai. But he um, he was the image of uh, of Thai uh, in the past. Uh, he was he he was caught in something that he his that is why he was not uh, accepted to be in the class. Thay was himself, but he um, he uh, he found a way out of that uh, and uh, got some transformation. That is why Thay said that. Uh, uh, I have left myself behind. Mm. The, uh, I am now the better self, and uh, the other I was not uh, the better self. He was still caught in some kind of uh, uh, problems. So that's what happened to everyone. Today we may be caught in some, uh, some worries and anger, we are not free enough, but tomorrow, maybe, a friend can help us and we get, uh, we practice and we get out of that uh, state of anger and fear and become another person. We are free. So the two persons are one, but uh, not exactly one, two. The third question, maybe the last. That's not a question. Tai, est-ce que tu pourrais nous raconter euh, chanter une chanson? Our friend is asking if Tai would sing us a song.
I'm going to sing you a French song. Okay? It's about a young man who came, who went to the forest, and who sat down at the foot of a palm tree. And suddenly, a, a boar, a boar, constrictor, came. And instead of uh, swallowing the young man, he, he just ate one of his fingers. And the young man asked why, why he did not, uh, he had not done any harm to the jungle, to the forest, and yet he was uh, one of his finger was eaten by an animal in the forest. I learned that that song when I was as young as uh, as you. <coughs> I try to remember. J'étais assis sous un palmier, oh, eh, aussi, aussi sain que le cruzoé, oh, eh, quand l'animal est arrivé, oh, eh, je l'ai, je, je l'ai senti m'en saluer, oh, eh. Avec joie, le gros bois, gros bois, gros bois. Il a mangé mon petit doigt, mon petit doigt, oui, mon petit doigt. Je ne sais pas, oui, pourquoi, oui, pourquoi, oui, pourquoi. Il a fait bobo à moi, bobo à moi. <coughs> Now the children can go out and play. Another question? <laughs> The last one. Did you, what made you want to do, make, what wanted you to be a, a monk? <laughs> like, what made you like, want to become a Zen master? Hmm. A Zen master is just a monk. Uh, who, who can share his practice with other people. The same, same thing. If you know how to breathe and you get uh, calm, you can share. You can share with other people and you can be a Zen master right away. Mm. When I was um, a little boy, I happened to see the drawing of a Buddha on the cover of a Buddhist magazine. The Buddha was sitting on the grass, so calm, so serene, so happy. And when I saw the picture of that Buddha, I, I had a desire to become someone like him, peaceful, happy, because around me, people were not mm. happy enough, serene enough, calm enough. 
And that is the first time the desire to, to become a monk was born in me. And uh, later on, I learned uh, that uh, not far from my house there was uh, a mountain and there was a monk practicing up there, a hermit, in order to become a, a Buddha. So my school, uh, it happened that, that my school organized a uh, outing. And uh, in order to go to that uh, mo- mountain, so I was very excited. I was so excited. At that time in my class, there was uh, about uh, 50 boys and only f- six girls. And uh, we organized uh, ourselves in groups of five. And we uh, was uh, told to bring uh, rice bowls, sesame seeds, and boiled water um, for the picnic. At that time, there was no Coca-Cola or anything like that. (laughs) When we came uh, to uh, the foot of the mountain, we tried to climb as quickly as possible. Especially me, because uh, they, they hoped to see the hermit living on the top of the mountain, practicing in order to become a Buddha. He was very excited. And all of us tried to climb as quickly as possible. We did not know anything about walking meditation. (laughs) We did not uh, know how to enjoy every step like here in the retreat. And that is why halfway to the mountain, we had drunk all our water. Everyone was thirsty. And everyone was tired. And the worst is that when he came to the top of the mountain, he learned that the hermit is, was not there. <laughs> Maybe the hermit uh, had uh, heard that uh, 500 uh, children were coming. <laughs> So he tried to hide himself in, <laughs> in the wood. And that is why, uh, why the other boys were uh, preparing uh, the picnic. They ventured alone into the wood with the hope to meet the hermit somewhere. And uh, suddenly he hear the sound of dropping waters. He just followed that, uh, that sound and he found out, he discovered a natural well with uh, stones. And the water was so limpid, so clear. And he was thirsty, very thirsty. So he knelt down and cupped the water and, and drunk. It's so delicious. I had never drunk anything like that. I'm, I think that's much better than Coca-Cola. <laughs> and after that, he lay down and he fell into a very deep sleep. He must have have had um, slept very deeply because when he woke up, he did not know where he was. Only a few moments after that, he realized that he was on the top of the Na mountain looking for the hermit. And suddenly in his mind, there is a thought that maybe the hermit had transformed himself into a well so that they had 
could have a private audience with him. And uh, I was very satisfied, although I did not uh, see the hermit, but meeting the well and drinking from the well made myself completely satisfied. I did not want to <coughs> to leave the place, but uh, remembering that uh, I remember that the four other boys were waiting for for me, so I had to to leave the place with uh, regret. And you know something? When I joined the other boys, I was very silent. I want to keep uh, that experience. Maybe that is the first uh, spiritual uh, experience in my life, very secret. And, uh, and during the time I walked down, I told myself that I have uh, tasted the best kind of, of water in the world. So although I did not meet the hermit, my faith in the practice of meditation strengthened. And finally, at the age of 16, I had the permission from my, from my parents to become, to, to go to the temple and ordain as a, a novice monk. When the children hear the small bell, they stand up and salute and continue the practice uh, outside. Dear Sangha, a question that has been asked should not be asked again. Like, uh, can you sing me a song? teachings you in the Dharma talks you had two of the 16 I believe breathing exercises were generate joy and generate happiness and I don't understand the difference and I believe it would help me in my practice if I could understand how to generate joy and generate happiness if they are different hmm. that is uh, a little bit uh, different a little difference between joy and happiness. That's according to the term is used in Buddhist uh, literature like that. In joy, there is still some excitement, but in happiness, uh, the excitement has died down. Suppose uh, a traveler uh, crossing a desert and uh, very thirsty, uh, it's so hot, and suddenly he discovered that there is uh, an oasis uh, in front of him, um, and uh, a lake uh, among the trees. So that uh, the feeling he had at that time is joy. There's a little bit excitement, joyful, but. Uh, 
excited. But when he actually arrived and kneel down and cup the water and drink, that is happiness. So, so there is a difference like that. And we learn that uh, the art of uh, being happy is very connected to the art of uh, suffering. If we know how to suffer, uh, we suffer less and we can create uh, a happiness making good use of uh, the suffering, like uh, people making good use of the, of the mud in order to grow lotus. There is a, a written question of a teenager, right? Dear Thai, our teenage friend um, asks, Dear respected Thai, brothers, sisters, and the Sangha, my father causes my family much suffering, and he does not follow right view. He takes up all of my mother's time so that she has none for my siblings and me. I have so much resentment and anger stuffed down in me, and he makes me very fearful. So how can I see myself with right view and love somebody unconditionally who does not even love themselves? How can I transform my suffering to peace and joy and accept him when he has hurt me so much? Thank you. When we have uh, a father who is not uh, happy, uh, when we have a mother who is not happy, we should uh, we should know that. Uh, it's not that uh, they do not want to be happy. They also want, it, want to be happy. They are not happy, and that is why they make the people uh, around them unhappy. Maybe they do not want to make people around them unhappy, but because uh, they don't know how to handle the suffering in them. And that is why the suffering is spilled all over around him or her. So as a young person, we have to look to understand. My father has a lot of suffering in him. He did not know how to handle and transform the suffering in him. So far, no one has helped him to handle the suffering in himself so that he can become more gentle, more compassionate, more joyful. Maybe I, I can be, I, I may be the first person who can help him, even if I am still very young. I have been able to encounter the Buddha Dharma, the practice of mindful breathing, mindful walking. I have learned how to calm down my emotion, my fear, my anger. I'm able to get in touch with the refreshing and healing things around me and in me. So I can, uh, I can uh, handle uh, better the anger and uh, 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 irritation and the despair in me. If I am I, be, I have become lighter, more free, uh, more compassionate, 
and I am in position to help my father or my mother. Uh, when my father says something or does something not, uh, not kind to me, not kind to my mother, instead of getting angry at him, I see the suffering in him that has pushed him to do or to say things like that. So I am protected by understanding and compassion. I do not get angry. And the first thing I can do. And if I do not get angry, if I preserve my peace, I can help my father. Maybe sometime when my father is in good uh, mood, I can sit down with him, I invite him for a walk, and I will tell him what I have learned to calm down my uh, feelings and so on. And uh, I'm able to listen to him and understand the suffering in him because I am a pleasant person. That is why my father likes to be close to me. Yes. A person who is, who is uh, calm, smiling, pleasant. People like to come to keep company with that person. So if I practice well, if I have more peace and um, compassion in me, I may help my father, my mother. In fact, uh, Many children who come to Plum Village, who come to our retreats organized uh, in Europe, in America, Asia, after having practice in the retreat, they have come home and they help their parents. And uh, they are able to uh, convince their parents to, to, to come and uh, participate in uh, in the next retreat. So the young people helping their parents, that has happened many times. And uh, when we look at our father and our mother who are not happy, who have a lot of suffering in them, there is understanding. And understanding always brings compassion. So we are not angry at them. Instead, we want to, to help them. And that is possible for, for young people to do. Children can, can practice and can help uh, their parents. How did mindfulness help you in your life? Dear Thai, how did mindfulness help you in your life? In your life, mindfulness. Mindfulness, uh, you know, is a kind of energy that helps you to, to, be, to be there in the here and the now. Mindfulness brings your mind home to your body and help you to see things very clearly. There are many wonderful things, beautiful things, refreshing and healing things. And if you uh, get in touch with them, you get the nourishment and healing. And that helps you every day. And in order to have mindfulness, you, you practice uh, breathing, walking mindfully, and you have that energy that helps you to live uh, deeply 
every every moment of your daily life. Uh, you are given 24 hours a day to live, and without mindfulness, you spend, you waste your time. You don't live your life deeply. There's no joy. There's no uh, peace. There's no happiness. There's full of you are full of worries and anger. So mindfulness helps you to uh, to be there, mind and body together and live each moment of your daily life deeply, so you don't waste your life, your time. And uh, if we know how to practice uh, mindful breathing, mindful walking every day, and then we have enough uh, the energy of mindfulness to do so, to live our life deeply with joy and peace, and which help us to help other people to do the same. Okay. Dearest Thai, it makes me so sad to see my friends committing sexual misconduct and doing drugs and becoming so angry because they suffer so deeply. The practice has helped me so much and I would like to help my friends as well. But at the same time, I don't want to force my views upon them, which might cause them to suffer more. So how can I bring the practice to life for the ones I love? Dear Thai, um, just to let everyone know, it's actually quite difficult to hear up here, so that's why we need to repeat. Um, so Dear Thai, our friend said that she feels very sad when she sees her friends who are committing sexual misconduct and using drugs and they suffer so much and they become angry. And our friend feels that she's benefited a lot from being able to be in touch with the practice and she wants to help her friends but she doesn't want to give them the feeling that she's forcing or imposing her views on them. So she wants to know how can she bring the practice alive to support her friends in a, in a way that doesn't uh, cause them to have a reaction. There are many ways to help a friend. The first way is just to tell your story. Do you want to, uh, to hear about uh, my experience uh, of uh, dealing with uh, anger or fear or sadness? And the other person might be interested in, in listening to because uh, she or he had been victims of fear, anger, and sadness. And if you know uh, how to deal with that, they will be interested to, to know. And um, 
you may write uh, her he may let telling your experiences in plum village or in a retreat don't try to to convert him or her into Buddh- buddhism no you should try to avoid that <laughs> uh, just tell your experience mm. tell what really happened in a retreat in a practice center like Pamlesh. And uh, that you water the good seeds in that person. Or you might like to invite uh, that person to come with you just for fun. Don't say, come and practice with me. Don't say that. Uh, Come and observe. And then uh, when uh, that person comes, uh, he will find the atmosphere uh, calm, peaceful, friendly, and he would like it. I think uh, if a person is caught in drugs and sex and other things like that, because uh, that person had not uh, experienced something better, So uh, the thing to do is to introduce him or her to a kind of environment, a kind of group of people who really are who are really happy, who do not use um, drugs, uh, alcohol, sex, and they are happy all day long. So to show them what is uh, true happiness. And then with uh, the experience of drugs and alcohol and sex, uh, that, um, that, that can be um, frustrating for him or for her in the past, he will abandon his old way and follow the new way. Good luck. as a Roman Catholic, so uh, one of the things was service. And so when I uh, service through the Roman Catholic charities and things like that, and so when I uh, encountered Buddhism and converted to Buddhism at a Catholic university, one of the things that was missing for me in my Buddhism was uh, engaged service. And so I found your work about engaged Buddhism, and uh, so I'm grateful you for that and I'm interested in uh, your comments on engaged Buddhism and particularly any um, stories in regards to also a great Catholic Thomas Merton if if there's any thoughts about that as well Many people uh, think that engaged Buddhism is the kind of Buddhism uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, that do that uh, does uh, social actions, engage in uh, social activities, and trying to help uh, reducing. Uh, uh, equality, uh, inequality, um, injustice, and so on. 
uh, fighting for more uh, um, freedom, democracy, uh, and so on. But uh, engaged Buddhism is first of all the kind of Buddhism that can be practiced at any time of the day. Buddhism not only practiced in the meditation hall, but also in the bathroom, uh, where when you drive the car, when you uh, take a shower, when you uh, work in uh, your office, uh, and so on. Buddhism should be present in every moment of your daily life so that you have more peace, um, uh, more freedom, uh, more joy. And if uh, you have uh, peace, freedom, and joy, other people will profit. Uh, you don't need to do it. Before you, you do something to help them, you are already helpful because uh, you, you set an example and you have the energy of peace and brotherhood and compassion uh, 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 radiating from your person. It's like a tree standing in the front yard. The tree does not uh, seem to do a lot of things, not en- engage enough in social life. <laughs> but the tree is doing its best. It's making uh, beautiful leaves, beautiful, beautiful flowers, and so, so on. Healthy, beautiful. And uh, we have, all of us have hope if a tree is a real tree, healthy, solid. Imagine a tree less than a tree. All of us will get into trouble. And that is why uh, if we know to harm, how to be a healthy person, human being, uh, happy, uh, compassionate. We are already serving the world. We don't have to, uh, to go out in order to do that. Wherever we are, we are helpful. So anything you can do for yourself, you do for all of us. If you know how to handle a, a painful feeling, uh, you profit from that, but all of us, profit from that at the same time. If you are angry, if you are despair, all of us suffer also. And that is why um, anything you can do uh, for yourself, you do for all of us. Um, Being should be at the foundation of doing. Uh, before you do peace, you have to be peace. When you are peace, everything you do is uh, peace work. Even if you uh, uh, sweep the floor, uh, clean the toilet, uh, take a shower, everything is for peace, if uh, you are peace within yourself. And that is why to uh, practice mindfulness, to take care of your body, your feelings, your perceptions, your mental formations. Uh, That is the art of being peace. And anything you do will be peace work, peace activities. Dear Tai, thank you for your wonderful teachings. I had a question about the 51 mental formations. Um, I feel a lot of shame a lot of the time, and I always thought that that was a negative seed and an unwholesome seed, but in your 51 formations, you see it as a positive seed and a wholesome seed, and you talk about inner shame and shame amongst others. 
and I'm very curious to know um, how you see shame as a wholesome seed and how to water that. There are mental formations that are that can be either wholesome or unwholesome, like uh, thinking. Thinking can be positive, and thinking can be negative. So, um, uh, regret, uh, for instance. Uh, Can be uh, can be positive or negative according to the situation. I think uh, uh, shame in Vietnamese uh, we have uh, tam and quý. Um, when you are alone, you when when you are alone. Uh, you uh, look deeply and you see that uh, you have not done your best. And you say that, uh, come on, uh, I have to, to do better. There's no one uh, judging and comparing, but you compare yourself, you with yourself. And you say that, well, I can do better. And that kind of feeling, that kind of mental formation can be very helpful. It helps you to do better. You are not satisfied with the degree of achievement that you have realized. So that is good. Qui means when you are in the presence of other people. And uh, if uh, the, the people who are of the same generation, who are in the same uh, training formation, and they are doing well, but why you are not doing as well as they do? Maybe uh, you have uh, some problems, some difficulties, and uh, that kind of feeling of shame help you to, to sit down and look deeply and to find out what is the kind of obstacles that prevent you to do as uh, well as other people. So this is a, a positive uh, a mental formation. My question is about hope. I've been working on myself for a number of years now, and my heart is still closed. And I believe it's because I'm, uh, I'm very afraid when I look at the world around me, when I see the, the pain and the fear and the anger in my society, in my family, in the students that I teach, and in myself, even, even now, here at this beautiful retreat. And your perspective is very valuable to me. I wonder, do you ever contemplate the future of the human race and our planet? Do you believe 
Do you believe that we can, the work we are doing, can save the world? I believe that, um, as I see it, the future is made uh, of the present. The future is made of one substance, the present. So when we look at the present, we can see already the future. But things are impermanent, we can change. And first of all, we have to change ourselves. And if, uh, personally, we can do our best, and that gives us a lot of peace already, because the, fu the, the future of the world does not depend solely one on, person, on one person. But you have done your part, and you have peace. We know that uh, civilizations have been destroyed several times on Earth. And our civilization may be destroyed in a few hundred years or less. So that is not something very new. And the human race can be wiped out. And Mother Earth will have to wait for many million years in order to bring us uh, out again. That is possible. Uh, for us, uh, 10 years, 30 years, are very long, and we have the feeling of running out of time. And for Mother Earth, well, her notion of time is different. If they did, she can wait uh, 100 million years. And that is why we have to learn to accept that uh, the extinction of uh, many uh, species on Earth, including the extinction of uh, man, is possible. But if uh, man has appeared on Earth once, he, she can appear again. And Mother Earth has enough um, patience. We have to learn these virtues from Mother Earth, non-discrimination, patience, unconditioned love. So contemplating on, on Earth, we can learn a lot and we can transform ourselves. We have to think of time uh, geologically. Mm, 100 years, that's nothing. And in the present moment, if we go deep, we can embrace uh, the whole eternity. There are those who, uh, who have uh, um, who are very sick, and the doctor uh, give them uh, three months five months to live only. And in the beginning, um, that person fight a lot because she cannot accept that she will die in three or four months. But once she can accept that, there is peace in her. And if there is a peace in her, it may turn out that she will be healed. She is not healed because uh, she does not have peace inside. And if now we allow despair to overwhelm us, there is no future. And that is why we have to learn to accept the extinction, the destruction of our, of our, of our civilization. And after that, we have peace. And if we have peace, we see clearly, more clearly, and we know what to do in order to avoid the catastrophe.
My question is also about the future. Scientists tell us that we've had, we've enjoyed 10,000 years of almost perfect conditions for humans to flourish. They also tell us that these favorable climatic conditions are ending, probably with immense challenges and consequences in terms of future suffering and strife. My question is, how do we balance compassion and mindfulness for future generations with compassion and mindfulness for current generations? How do we reconcile these priorities and urgencies? An example of the future, of the balance. Well, I mean, it's, it's clear that climatic changes could unravel social structure, which would bring on strife and violence, hunger, drought, famine, at an unprecedented scale. unless we act more responsibly to the planet. As you say, Mother Earth can take care of herself, but can we as a species? How do we balance today's urgencies with our children's and grandchildren's urgencies? <clears throat> yeah, so um, our friend is, is also very aware of the suffering that may be, may be waiting for us as a result of climate change. And he's asking about balancing the urgent demands of right now with the urgency of acting in a way that may help avoid that suffering from climate change. So would one example be um, the needs of some developing countries to rapidly, they may feel they need to rapidly industrialize, and then there are other countries that are asking them not to generate that much emissions. Would that be an example of the balance that you're asking about? So how do we balance the needs of people right now um, with the results that that may have that cause suffering in the future. <clears throat> I think <clears throat> I think that uh, we had to redefine um, Uh, the notion of uh, happiness. Because uh, everyone is uh, seeking happiness. They are striving because they want to be happy. But uh, do we have enough time to sit down and figure out what is true happiness? Are there happy people? Can you produce a happy person? Can you produce a group of happy people and show them that this is true happiness? And that group of people, that group of people who are happy, do they need uh, to to uh, to uh, consume a lot, to spend a lot of money? to eat a lot of meat, to drink a lot of alcohol, to have a lot of sex. So, so maybe uh, we can help produce uh, a group of people, a community that is uh, truly happy, and invite people to come and see, so that they will abandon their path and follow the new path. 
I think uh, technology in our time are trying to help us to run away from ourselves, from our family and from for nature. We know that uh, there is suffering inside of us and we do not know how to handle the suffering inside. So we need means in order to escape. And many of the electronic, electronic devices uh, that we buy is uh, are helping us to run away. Running away from ourselves, running away from our families, from nature, and gets more uh, sicker and sicker. Uh, alienation from self, alienation from family and nature. So can we invent a kind of uh, new technology that help us go home and take care of self, take care of family, and take care of nature? And that can be then that can be a pleasant thing to do also. And that is uh, the right direction for civilization. So for now, we go in the wrong direction, direction of alienation from self, from family, from nature. If we get wake up, we see that this is not the right path. And uh, there is a joy when you discover the right path. And uh, our happiness is based on that kind of insight. And together we can come back and try to rebuild man, rebuild family, rebuild nature. I think that is the problem of civilization. Dear Chai, thank you. Just want to comment that you guys look beautiful and peaceful. And a greater view is back there when you see Tay and the monk, sister and brother here, and how collectively you look so, so wonderful. Tay, my um, situation is not too different, or my question is not too different from. Uh, the fellow teenager, well, no, I'm not a teenager, a teen the teenager that raised the question. Um, but the difference is that as a child or uh, a dependent, you're not in the position to make a decision to leave. Yesterday you spoke of um, a neighborhood that is toxic. Um, in your practice, you're not strong enough to change or transform it. So in the situation of the teenager, the mother has the ability to make a decision to pull out. Um, though the father suffers significantly, and, but it's not within your capacity to help them and he continues to make the rest of the family suffer. Um, do you, what do you do? And um, it's hard to apply the practice in that context for me. Um, and also, the teachings of generosity, compassion, um, helps me, but it contradicts, it would seem, what 
everyone else is telling me that if I I'm happy just to surrender all my finance, finances, not all, but um, am, I'm being foolish. But in myself, when I look deeply, I am not angry and I don't want, I don't need all those. I can be okay. So I'm just confused if I am truly knowing what I know and practicing the right way. Thank you. Um, so dear friend, are you saying that you are in a kind of situation that's similar to the one that was described in the teenager's letter? Yes. Okay. Okay. And so, um, dear Tai, I think our friend is saying she's in a same kind of situation with a very difficult person in the home. And she's recalling what Tai taught about how if we're in a very painful, difficult environment, like a violent neighborhood, and if our practice isn't strong enough yet to, to be able to transform what's around us, that sometimes we need to remove ourselves. And I also hear our friend is looking at the question of her financial security. If she removes herself from the home, she may have to suffer some insecurity around money. And she, no, that's not it. Terms of separation always is painful, and if you go through the lawyers, it's always dragged through, and the lawyers benefit, and there's lots of pain, and and I don't want to go through that. Um, but the terms that are being presented to me are very are seen by my family as very detrimental to the future and finances of my children. Um, I'm willing to accept them because because I don't want to be angry, I don't want to fight. I just want to move on. Um, there, <coughs> there is a possibility to uh, to make good use of the mud, to grow the lotus. <coughs> I'm thinking of uh, a Sangha, a community of practice. If you are not strong enough, you have to take refuge in the Sangha. You can borrow the energy of the Sangha in order to do what you want to do, transforming the mud into the lotus. If you are alone, if your mindfulness is not strong enough, but you have uh, the intention, you see the way. And if uh, you have the support of a whole group of people behind you, you'll be able to do what you, uh, you want to do. First of all, the practice of uh, compassion. That we have learned here in the uh, retreat. Uh, when we look at one person who is not happy, because uh, a person who is happy will never create suffering for the people around. When you see that a person is not happy, a person that has a lot of suffering, difficulties in him or her, our understanding of uh, the suffering gives rise to compassion. And that makes us suffer less right away. Because we don't want to punish, we don't want to fight anymore because there is no anger in us, there is only uncompassion. 
the situation has become much easier after that. And that takes, uh, that does not take a lot of time. That takes uh, awakening. Awakening means, I know, that is uh, a person with a lot of suffering. He does not need uh, punishment. He needs help. And I may be the person who can help him. So, uh, you have compassion in your heart. You don't suffer much more. And with the support of a group of people who practice the same understanding and compassion, you continue to make progress in, in, in every day. That is the first uh, half uh, of the answer. The second half of the answer is that uh, we are used to the kind of comfort. And we believe that without that comfort we cannot survive. Material comfort and um, affective, uh, uh, affective uh, comforts. <coughs> In the time of the Buddha, there are many people who are high in society who have left uh, their situation and become uh, a practitioner with the Buddha, like uh, Governor Badia. And uh, he was not happy as uh, a governor. He had uh, many soldiers to uh, guard for him, to protect his house. And <coughs> he was afraid that uh, during the night, maybe someone can come and kill him and get uh, the money, the valuables, and things like that. And um, finally, he joined uh, other members of the royal family, and he became a disciple of the Buddha. He did not uh, bring anything with, with him, because uh, every day he went with the Buddha for the arm round and eat anything that people give him in his bowl. And in the night, he slept, he spent the night at the foot uh, of a tree. And uh, one night, during his uh, sitting meditation, he uttered all my happiness, all my happiness, two times. So a monk who was sitting close by, he heard that. He thought that uh, the monk Bhadja may have regretted for having uh, abandoned his, uh, his post as governor and become a monk. So he went to the Buddha and reported to the Buddha what he had heard during the night. So the Buddha asked someone to call Bhadya and uh, ask him whether that is true, that during the night, during sitting meditation, he had uttered these two words, oh, my happiness. And Bhadya said, yes. My teacher, I did pronounce this word two times. And the Buddha said, would you explain to us? And he said that, well, when I was uh, a governor, I was rich, I had a lot of money, a lot of uh, soldiers, and I was always afraid. I did not have peace, I have, did not have happiness. But now, as I am a monk, I don't have anything to lose. <laughs> I don't... Uh, well, uh, uh, nobody is trying to kill me anymore because I have no valuables, no money, nothing. And I feel great peace. I have, nev I have never been happy like I am now. That is why during sitting meditation, I have pronounced two times the expression, oh my happiness, oh my happiness. And if I have disturbed some of my... Uh, uh, co-practitioners, I apologize. So now you know that in Plum Ridge, hundreds of monks and nuns and, uh, and lay people live together in brotherhood. None of us 
has a bank account. None of us has a private car. And uh, everything is belong to the community. And none of us has a salary. And yet there is a brotherhood, sisterhood, joy. And we, we, we are nourished by the joy and happiness um, uh, of seeing people coming with us and practice and transform. Uh, people would be scared when they think that one day they will have no, they have no money, have no uh, bank account, no car, no house, no money to pay the rent. But there are many ways of uh, living that uh, can bring happiness. And we do not necessarily have uh, uh, money and uh, uh, situation in order to be happy. So um, if you are not afraid, uh, we can accept any situation and we can get freedom very quickly. If we are not caught by the kind of uh, comforts that we have been used to. So that is the second uh, half of the answer. Mm. I think uh, it's time to... Uh, yeah. Dear Thay, we just ask Thay's compassion to answer one other question from a person who's suffering quite a lot. Um, it says, I can't seem to overcome my suffering. I constantly cry and crave for something I don't have, something more. I see no light and I feel no joy. There is always only pain, tears and thoughts of death. I can't seem to transform this state that I've been experiencing this year, and I want to give up and die. I wish for it now. How do you know it is time? This pain feels insurmountable. Um, when we look uh, deeply, looking deeply is uh, the act of uh, meditation. If we have some time, and if, uh, do, if uh, we do not lose that time by thinking and losing hope, we might like to use that time in order to look deeply into our situation. When we walk, we might realize that uh, our feet are strong enough for us to walk. And there are those people who cannot walk. Are you able to enjoy your feet that are strong enough to help you to walk and to run? You have to recognize that you are happier, luckier than uh, the other people who do not have uh, feet uh, strong enough like uh, yours. You have to see that you have eyes still in good condition. If you open your eye, you can see the blue sky, you can smile to the blue sky. There are people who cannot see the blue sky. So happiness is possible with mindfulness. Of course, they are suffering, but uh, we can handle them. When we step on a thorn, we suffer. 
And if we step on uh, a second tone, a third tone, ten tones, we know that there are ten tones to, to, to remove, to be removed. And when you are able to remove one, one, one tone, you get a relief. And if you are able to relieve the second tone, you get another relief. And that is possible in the here and the now. And someone can help you. Some community of practice can help you and show you the way. Because those of us uh, practicing in the community, we have already experienced uh, suffering, difficulties, and despair. And we can tell you how uh, we got out of despair. How uh, uh, we could remove uh, thorns uh, one by one from our body. You don't need to remove all the thorns in order to get a relief. One thorn removed gave you relief. You can see the already a difference. And that is why um, uh, to allow oneself uh, to be overwhelmed, drowned into despair, that is because uh, you do not know how to use your time in order to look deeply. To look deeply, you see that there is hope, there is a possibility to get a relief and to free yourself slowly from the difficult situation. And there are people who have uh, gone through uh, difficulties and who can help you. Uh, that is why in the Buddhist tradition, we, uh, we learn that uh, Sangha beauty is a very important uh, task. So the Sangha is made of people who practice, who, who have uh, transformed a number of their sufferings, and who can experience the joy and, uh, of living, and who can share and help you uh, in the practice. So uh, maybe uh, my answer is that you, uh, you go to a friend, you go to a sangha, where people who have gone through difficulties, and you learn from them how to, how to slowly get in out of the difficult situation, uh, little by, by little. And uh, there have been, there are people who have been in very difficult situation, and yet they were able, they were able to come out, thanks to the practice, thanks to the support of a sangha, a community of practitioners. <laughs>